Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today we're finally going to talk about A Memory of Light, the final book of the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. So we're going to go into some kind of, we're going to go into mild detail. I'm not going to go through point by point everything that happened in the story. I'm just going to try to focus on some highlights and some stuff that really stood out to me. We'll have plenty of time in other videos to get into the nitty gritty of everything. So yeah, this video will contain all sorts of spoilers. So yeah, be warned for that. So yeah, with that being said, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and let's begin So let's start off just talking about um, immediately what uh, happened, basically. So we start off where we left off, of course. Um, the city of Camelot is under attack, and we find out that, of course, it is a move by, like, the Dark Friends and stuff. It is a Trollic army. It is basically one of the first uh, blows of the final battle. So... At the same time, though, everyone knows that they need to get to Marilor because we need to have this huge summit of everyone and, you know, have the conversation with Rand and everything. So word gets to Elaine and everyone about the actual siege and everything, about the, actually not even a siege, about the attack on the city and while they're at Marilor and they're about to have this conversation. They basically come to the conclusion that they have to leave the city. They have to give up the city for a loss and stuff. So they send some people to make um, gates and everything, way, uh, not way gates, um portals basically gateways in order to try to help us get out as many refugees as possible so they do get out like a lot of refugees and end up saving people and stuff and then but the city itself is like a total loss so we basically go into the meeting at Marilor with that already in the air so it's already kind of tense and stuff so I thought that was kind of a cool way to set it up and apart from that we're getting a lot of stuff from the Black Tower so I want to actually go ahead and talk about Pravara and Andral first because they are so, they're such a big part of the beginning of the book. And to me, it feels a lot like we're backtracking. We're like kind of covering a lot of stuff that got left out before. Like how I said in my previous review, there's not like a lot of Black Tower stuff. I feel like a lot of the arc going on with the Black Tower should have been stretched out over multiple books. But this feels like a lot of, um, you know, back, not backpedaling, like a uh, back keeping, I guess. I don't know. I don't have a word for it. It feels like, you know, just going back um, and, you know, finishing what was left out more or less. So we kind of see um, more into the whole thing that's going on at the Black Tower with uh, Taim using Merdral and other channelers to forcibly change the allegiance of the uh, men of the Black Tower from, you know, serving the light to serving the shadow and stuff. And it's basically kind of closing in on everyone. Like a lot of people that haven't been turned already are starting to speculate what's going on. There's basically two factions, the people that follow Taim versus the people that follow Loghain. So we kind of end up learning that um, Taim is not just working with the Forsaken. He's not just working with the Chosen. He has been named a Chosen now. So he is uh, Mahal, I believe it's pronounced. And he is officially one of the Chosen. So like, I kind of like that for him in the terms of his arc because he was so ambitious and so untrustworthy that I'm like, I knew something was going to come of it. Like, So it's like, as far as being a bad guy, he rose to the highest point on the ladder that he possibly could. So it was like, oh, good for you. Good job and all that stuff. But so, it, I don't know. It was one of those things that like I predicted early on pretty much as soon as he popped up. I felt like he was going to be a bad guy. He was going to initiate some kind of like turncoat situation with the other channelers against Rand and stuff like that. So to see that just get confirmed over and over again and then to greater and greater degrees is just a lot of fun. So before we actually talk about the meeting at Marilor, I just want to say um, there are a couple things in this book that I really, really don't like and it almost completely ruins everything for me to a degree. So I've already bitched about it in the previous video about the whole um, Sean Chan slavery thing. I'm really, really irritated that the series actually ended with slavery still being a thing, and then you kind of introduce an entire other country and an entire other culture that is based on slavery as well. And it's like, it's really kind of, unless I misunderstood the Charons, the Charons thing that Demandre brings with him, unless I've misunderstood that setup. They may just be like kind of enslaved in a way because a Forsaken rules the country now, so I, I, I don't know. But like, um... I just really, really hate that. I hate, I can't stand it. The entire situation and the conversation that Rand has with Tuan and the way that it is established as it'll remain and stuff. I don't like that because I feel like in a series where so many sharks are kind of jumped 
where we um, get so many fake out deaths and so many miraculous kind of resurrections and stuff like that. So many things that to me kind of break the immersion in a lot of ways. Like it kind of annoys the crap out of me that we can't do the same thing in this situation just to like end one of these atrocities to just kind of clean the board to actually make the next age truly be better than the previous one and it's just like it feels like such a weird thing to just not wrap up when you have the opportunity to and it's just i don't i don't like it i really can't stand it and i really don't understand why it's stuck there and as a result it makes it makes me not like Tuan as much as i did when her and matt were initially courting and stuff i really like their banter and their back and forth and stuff but the way she's just you know holding so hard on to keeping the demoni and stuff when there's an entire cultural hypocrisy around it and now she knows about that hypocrisy and still is going to fight for people to be enslaved it, it makes it worse. And then the fact that Matt doesn't really try to convince her that this is all wrong kind of means that he kind of approves of it. He kind of accepts it. And it just, it, I don't like that at all. So it kind of actually dings my enjoyment of Matt a bit. It kind of knocks that down a little bit. So that entire situation, I just think was really unnecessary and really could have just been written out. Like, I really don't get it. Like, I understand not doing it before the battle because, like, they've established there's such a huge psychological issue with a lot of the Demani and stuff. Like, they can barely, you know, they can't be rehabbed within, you know, the time that they would need to be to fight and stuff like that. But to just not even have, like, a provision or something to be, like, within, you know, the first 10 years of the Dragon's 100-year piece or whatever, you have to phase that out entirely or something like that. I just... I just hate that like nothing is done about it and we just kind of play it off. And then one of the last things we actually see in the book is someone else being enslaved. I mean, granted, they're forsaken, so it's, I mean, I don't even know if it's okay, but like, ugh, I'm a terrible part, do terrible people deserve terrible, terrible, well, yeah, terrible people deserve terrible punishments. That's, yeah, I can't even do that. But either way, so like, I just don't like it. That's one of the things I really, really didn't like. But um, something else I didn't actually like that I'm starting to see online that a lot of other people did enjoy is the whole body swap thing. So I don't like that at all. I think it feels like a huge cop out because I feel like Rand should have died. He was supposed to die. The, otherwise, those wounds don't make any sense. And it's, I mean, they still kind of make sense, but they feel very inconsequential as a factor of the fact that he just kind of, you know, sidesteps it a lot. <laughs> like, so it's just, I don't know. In the whole thing, of, I mean, granted, yes, we set it up that he's going to die and basically put forth the idea so much that it is a cool subversion of expectation to not have him die so that's okay but it's like it just i don't know it just makes more sense for him to have died and to conclude the whole thing and then for him to essentially abandon everyone and like his dad was mourning so like painfully like you really felt it and everything like and then for the three women that knows he's alive or four women that knows he's alive to not say anything to at least Tam or something. I mean, I don't know. I just don't like it. I think it would have been cleaner if he would have actually died and the age ends with the death of the dragon instead of having this potential god avatar creature just hanging around in the body of a forsaken. Because when he lights the pipe without using the one power or the true power or anything like that, that's just reality warping, which means he is still the light. Because I think... A lot of the stuff we saw at the final battle with him against Shaitan was just confirming he is the avatar of the light and his soul is still the avatar of the light. So he's a functional god on earth and is a reality warper. So like that just feels like such a loose end to me in a lot of ways that I just, I didn't like it that much. I didn't like it. So I guess that's my little rant about uh, those couple things that really kind of stuck with me. Even after finishing it and sitting it with a few days, sitting with it for a few days and stuff, I still don't care for it. I just, I really think Rand should have actually died and like stayed dead. And I really wish the Sean Chan's entire culture at this point could be obliterated and started over. <laughs> the whole, I just, I really can't stand it. That's one of the things that I really, really, really don't like. So yeah, let's go ahead and talk about Marilor. Let's talk about the meeting at the on the field of Marilor. So we all of our people meet up. We got this huge amount of people and stuff. And everybody's there. They're all speculating. We got everybody in their different camps and stuff. And it just feels like all these potential reunions are just sitting right here. Like we got Elaine and Egwene and Nynaeve and Rand and like every just all our characters are all but they're just all in separate camps and stuff. But like Egwene and Elaine are like gateway into each other and stuff and they're like talking and whatnot. So that's cool. We got a little bit of a reunion there, but it didn't really play off in that way. But I was really, really looking forward to a Tarvir and three 
reunion, and I didn't get it, and I'm really annoyed by it, because I don't know, see, I wonder, at this point, I wonder if Brandon didn't do a specific, like, reunion for the three of them together, because he wasn't confident in his way to write their dynamic, all three of their dynamic together, so he just kind of didn't do it that way, because there's like a reunion with Perrin and Ran, and then there's like a reunion with Matt and Ran, and then kind of a reunion with Perrin and Matt a little bit. So it's like, it's never them all together just chilling, interacting, which I really wanted to see. But we did get a lot of fun stuff with Matt and Ran. We got a lot of cool little interactions there. Like, I really like the whole one, one upping each other. He's like, I cleanse Sidene. He's like, yeah, well, I saved Moraine, so I won. So like, I really like that kind of stuff. That was a lot of fun. But the meeting itself, it basically, we get to outline Rand's uh, demands. We find out what his demands are. Basically, he's ransoming his life because he, even like at this point, we're like, yes, he's going to die. So, I mean, I guess that's why he goes into hiding and doesn't tell anybody because the nature of the contract piece is like based upon his death. It's like that is the, you know, exchange. So he can't really let more people know that he's alive because it'll invalidate the dragon's piece, I guess. That's probably the main reason. So, but that's essentially what, what is one of Rand's demands. Like, in exchange for his life, he like, I want 100 years of peace. And I want, like, you know, no interaction and all this kind of stuff. But I noticed during this entire conversation, when all the arguments and stuff break out with the monarchs and stuff, it's really interesting to me, um, Elaine's reaction to it. So, like, not only is Elaine, like, queen of two uh, kingdoms or whatever, she has two queendoms, like, so it's made very clear with the deal she made with the wise women, with the kinswomen, like, how she's got them, like, as a standing healing force and stuff, and, like, how she uh, got a contract with the uh, band of red hand, and she's got, like, the dragons and stuff now. It's like, she is amassing power in a kind of terrifying way, and it's like we're starting to see like her ambitions a lot more it felt like in that uh, meeting because she's very much wasn't like okay with the pieces stuff. so I'm like what well, are you really expect like planning to expand your borders even more I'm like what's going on with that so like that whole thing I thought was really interesting and then you know it gets to the other demands that were like the big things really it's like because Rand wants to break the seals and Egwene is like super nope and stuff so they get into a huge argument about it he calls her a spoiled brat and stuff and he actually like loses his cool and like it's so I kind of like that because it reminds me like of, you know, the Emmonsfield days and stuff. It, it's, it almost came across as an argument they would have had back then, which I think was the point. And like, so it, it was just a really cool interaction. But then all of that stuff gets immediately squashed when uh, Moraine walks in. So like, that was one of the things too that kind of annoyed me. Because I was waiting for these uh, reunions. Like Perrin was there. He was in the tent and stuff. In attendance. And like, you know, Matt uh, uh, Ran was there. And everybody was all there and stuff. But it's like, Matt just kind of drops off Moraine and doesn't even come say hi. Like, I haven't seen all you people in, like, so long and stuff. Doesn't he say anything? So I just, I don't know, I didn't like that. Because I'm like, where is he going? Like, he needs to be a part of this. Because I felt like he was getting set up to be, you know, the leader of all the planning, all the war planning and stuff. So when he goes to Ibudar to go deal with Tuan to go find her, I'm like, man, that's really boring. Like, I, didn't, I just really didn't like that. So... The, when Moraine comes in, she basically shuts down everything. All this arguing and stuff. Like, y'all whining and crying and stuff like this. And she's like, no, y'all gotta sign this paper. The peace is necessary. She's basically quoting scripture. She's quoting specific prophecies and parts of prophecies and stuff. That basically saying he was going to do all this regardless. Like, all of this is all prophesied and stuff like that. So, and he, she basically tells Egwene, like, you're going to break the seals. Rand isn't going to break the seals. You're going to break the seals. But the way she explains it, it feels like it was the prophecy. But what actually happens in the book is Loghain breaks the seals. So, I'm wondering if she basically meant Egwene controls when the seals will be broken versus actually breaking them. Because technically, I don't think they were broken until after she died. So, that's just kind of something I noticed there. So Rand's um, actual so Rand's actual demands were that the seals be broken, a um, hundred years of peace, and that he's to be given command of all the armies and stuff. But they make a really good argument, a good point to him that you can't be dealing with the Dark One and somehow commanding all the armies across all these battles and stuff. So he relents on that. So I like how he has these direct um, demands and stuff, but he kind of relents a little bit on each of them. Like, he relents on the seals, he relents on the controlling the armies, and he kind of allows uh, addendums to be made to the dragon's peace. So this is another thing that I thought was interesting. So it feels like a confirmation of the 
the averting the future that Avienda saw. So in the future that she saw, the Dragon Peace had been the thing, but because the Aiel weren't a part of it, that basically means that it's okay for any other country to attack them without being in breach of the Dragon's Peace. So therefore, they become a target and nobody else can help them. So that's why they were getting attacked and like treated so terribly and stuff and like couldn't get any kind of help. So they basically make a change to it that allows them to be the police force between all the kingdoms and stuff. So they aren't, you know, outsiders and stuff. They're an integral part of the entire thing. So I think that alone is like enough of a significant change that will completely change everything that Avienda saw. Like, so I think that's, and I think if I remember correctly, in one of the visions, like it was implied that Egwene is still alive. Like one of her, uh, she was, yeah, because she lives like a long, 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 long time being nice to die and stuff. So she was still alive and knowing that she doesn't live, you know, at the end of this book, that means that that future has to be just completely changed at this point. So I'm cool with that. <laughs> so I think it's interesting that Elaine ends up being appointed like the commander of all the armies. It's it's an interesting decision. Like it didn't feel like it, anything like that was set up. I really was expecting Matt to be there because he has been built up this entire time with all these memories and all these stratagems and all, all that kind of stuff like that, that he was going to be the primary war commander for all of this stuff. And I was just really confused why, like, in all this conversation about all this stuff, like, nobody brought him up. Nobody talked about it. I'm like, his reputation has to be such that, like, people know that he is the better choice. Like, Talmanis was there and, like, a lot of other people from the band and stuff was there. So, like, I feel like, I don't know, it feels like it should have been a more obvious choice instead of having him come in later and do it. But I feel like that was kind of done as a... Um, like we're losing so we need our best in there like we kind of have to set up the ebb and flow of the battle like the good guys gotta win a little bit then lose a little bit then come back so it was kind of setting up that kind of thing so it was more of a structural choice than a story arc choice which i can understand so after the meeting you basically everything immediately pops off like it all gets going like immediately so let's go ahead and jump into the last battle. I'm going to kind of talk about it generally a little bit. Then I want to kind of break it down character by character. Again, I'm not going to be able to go into every detail because so much stuff happens in this book. It honestly feels like it could have been three separate books with the level of information that just gets, you know, fed to you in this book. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and go through it. So, so the war starts basically immediately after this meeting. It ends up getting set up like to be fought on four different fronts. So at Shao Ghul, where Rand is, basically he needs to be protected while he's dealing with Shaitan. So we have, um, what is his name? How do you pronounce that name? Alterauda? I, I Rudo. <laughs> so we have that guy being one of the great captains there, being the leader of that entire fight. So he's like making all the big strategy moves and all that kind of stuff. And we also have over in Shinar, we have... Um, um, Agomar, Ag Aglomar, Ag Ag yeah, Agul, <laughs> some of these names, man, are terrible, I'm trying, so we have, uh, Ag Agomar over there, like, one of the other great captains, and then we have in Camelin, we have, um, we have, uh, um, um, over in Camelin, we have, uh, Fael's, uh, dad or uncle, uh, Davron Bashir, so we got him over there, and then we got, and we have Gareth Bryn and Kandor. So we got four different setups, four different great captains. We got basically four different like really good battle strategists and like really experienced people. So like the four wars being fought on four different fronts and stuff. So at first everything seems like it's going really good. I'm feeling really confident stuff that we're learning. Like they're pushing back the shadow spawn and stuff. I'm like, okay, but me just in my head, I understand like, you know, just on a meta level, like it's a book. So they got to start losing soon in order to kind of get pushed back on their heels because then they can come back for the great victory and stuff because that's just how it works in fantasy really. That's just, it is what it is. But <laughs> like, that's just kind of how it goes. So I wasn't really surprised when we started to see, we started to hear about these little mistakes that are happening. Like some of the captains are just making like, oh, maybe he has an off day or whatever. He did this thing that got all of these soldiers killed and wiped out all of this entire squad and stuff like that. Because they just made this one decision and sent these people th there instead of over here and stuff like that. So all of that stuff happening while we are cutting to uh, Grendel, I think the Forsaken, who's in the dream world, just kind of sneaking around doing her thing and everything. So I'm like, okay, so that's the one that loves to compel people. So I'm like, she's doing something. I didn't realize you can, in the dream world, apparently compel people 
to that degree to do stuff like that. Because we find out she's basically been using compulsion weaves to very subtly make all the captains make different mistakes so that they could start either prolonging the battle or losing their battles in certain areas and stuff. And it's kind of trippy because, like, it was just something that felt very new. It felt very um, newly introduced and stuff. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. But it creates this huge trust situation. And basically, in the meantime, where Matt is, he's in Ibuldar with the Sean Chan and stuff. He's trying to get all their soldiers together because he's going, you know, of course, have them join the fight and everything after having to basically do some more political maneuver and the stuff with other people because it's just ugh, so much with the Sean Chan is so annoying a lot. And like, he even has got like political maneuvering within the ranks because his position is not the war commander. Like, just all kinds of extra nonsense. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mad at the Sean Chan even now. Like, I've had time to sit with him. I just still, the whole thing is just, it feels tainted at this point. But so, so eventually, like even, it's, I thought it was a really cool scene though. While basically before Matt is appointed the commander to everybody, he kind of is looking at the battle decisions, looking at the field and seeing what's going on. He's like, hmm, Gareth Brennan is a dark friend. <laughs> like, wait, what? Like he just kind of picks it up immediately out of nowhere because he sees the moves that are being made. And like he immediately comes to the conclusion like, Either he is purposely trying to sabotage this battle and, like, working against us, or he's being compelled or something like that's happening, or he's just a straight-up dark friend and stuff. So he just sees it and everything, but he eventually ends up getting put in control of the entire command system or whatever. So I was waiting for, like, what felt like a really long time for that to happen. So I'm like, he's been set up for so long with all these memories in his head and, like, his strategies and everything like that. I'm like, he definitely should have been the war commander from jump. So he ends up creating a situation where instead of the battle being fought on four different points, they basically make a big move to get everybody back to a central location because he's basically saying we need to make a giant um, move in order to get a definitive blow in order to really, like, stop this war from being so evenly fought because I could, you know, being that evenly fought, like, there's no progress. So it all goes to Marilor and it's like one giant battle left or whatever. It gets all the people there and, like, waiting for all the Trollocs and everything to show up. And it, what feels like completely out of nowhere, there's an entirely new force of people that gets introduced from another country that we just knew nothing about the entire time. And that's the Charons, the Sharons or whatever, or Chirons or, Sh I don't know, probably Sharon, like the, the ferryman to the underworld in Greek mythology. But like, Demondred, the Forsaken, he apparently went and took over an entire other country and then like enslaved all the channelers and stuff and made them his major force to just go and show up. And they like open a giant gateway and start attacking people and taking people out and stuff and like it's crazy. And there's just all kinds of stuff going on immediately. So like that kind of sets up the main last um, big battle part. We got the rest of the Shadow Spawn that showed up. We got all the red, the rest of the main force that's all there. And we got all these Sharons and stuff. And basically, so that's our big bat. We've, we've gone from this very scattered kind of battle where there's all this kind of stuff going on to now we have a centralized figure that we need to take out in order to cripple his forces in order to actually make a definitive move. So Matt ends up in a situation where, you know, they're playing chess against each other. They're, you know, both great military commanders and stuff with eons of experience and everything. To the point where Demon Demondre thinks that he's going up against Rand or going up against Luz Theron. Because he's like nobody else would have this breadth of knowledge to be able to make these moves. Like you need insane levels of experience and like history to like do this kind of stuff that Matt's pulling off. So he thinks he's going up against some ancient when it's Matt just stuffed full of ancient memories and stuff. But he basically creates a situation where they kind of ride the losses and make it appear as, as though they're losing in order to create a situation where they can make a definitive strike in order to like go back and like come up for the win, the, you know, last minute win kind of situation. And basically when that is put into place, Matt goes ahead and gets into battle. He kind of sends off some of the copies of the Foxhead medallions to try to, you know, help other people in specific places. Because through all of this stuff, people are trying to go after Demondred and stuff, trying to take him out. And, like, they keep failing and everything. So, like, um, both the Trican boys try. Um, Gawain, I believe, is uh, Egwene's warder. He goes and try after having basically only been protecting her forever, like, through the entire battle. He's honestly getting bored and stuff. Well, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about him and, like, after I finish talking about Matt. Let me just finish talking about Matt and I'll talk about the Tricane boys. 
But essentially, uh, Matt, when he gets down in the field and stuff and he starts fighting and everything, like he sees Perrin and stuff. And that's like when they have a cool mini reunion and stuff. But they end up talking about Pat on Fane and stuff, who we all now know is responsible for Perrin's family's death and everything. So like it's kind of set up in this quick kind of offhanded way that Perrin like wants revenge and he wants to go against Pat on Fane and everything. And which we can understand and, you know, respect and everything. But then immediately Fane attacks Matt. And he uses the the thing from from Shadow Logoth, right? The the inherent evil thing that, based on its dialogue, seems like a third deity or something. Almost, I don't know. It's like some crazy force, but essentially, it was taking over Pat and Fane and becoming more real, like more a part of reality instead of just being like a spirit thing. And, but essentially, it amounted to nothing because Matt kills it really quickly. Like, he, he gets stabbed through the chest with, like, mist or whatever. But because he's been influenced by the dagger, he can't be influenced by it again. So he's just able to kill Fane and, like, stab him with the dagger. And he, you know, melts and so does the dagger and the ruby and everything. So, like, that just kind of... As having been, like, this creepy behind-the-scenes, like, oh, there's Fane again. Oh, now he's taking over, like, uh, Shadow Spawn and stuff. Like, he's a different threat. Like, and it just kind of... It doesn't really amount to anything. <laughs> it just kind of... was like, okay, he was there. Like, now he's gone. It just... It really didn't amount to anything. I was like, huh. Eh, eh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Matt gets the kill. But, like, I thought it... Part of me feels like Perrin should have got the kill. But the way it all kind of happened, like it would have been far more drawn out if Perrin would have fought him because he clearly would have been able to be affected and stuff. So that's a whole thing. But I can accept it. So I think Matt had a decent little arc in this book. Like it was, he, like Perrin did what I feel like is the least of all the big characters. And Matt did just a little bit more than he did. Not nearly as much as I expected him to do. But his entire arc and everything that goes on in the book, it's, it's kind of interesting. He has a lot of cool moments and stuff. But it's, he wasn't nearly as involved as I would have expected. And that honestly disappoints me a little bit. And I am also, again, as I said, a little disappointed in him because his, like, the weird acceptance of... I mean, I guess because, whatever, you can come up with a million excuses as to why he just accepts Tuan's, you know, the, the Sean Chan's, uh, Dumani, and all that kind of stuff. So, like, without ever even trying to push against it at all, I guess you can come up with excuses, but I don't like it. It gave me a negative feeling. I didn't care for it, and I'm just telling you how I feel. So, yeah, I didn't care for that part. So, that'll do it for Matt. So, let's go ahead and talk about Perrin. Perrin has been my favorite character on principle from the start, right? Like, just any character that is a werewolf-type character, I have a bias towards that fantasy creature, so I'm going to be a fan regardless and i just really liked Perrin like all the way like basically up to lord of chaos i thought he was awesome i thought that was just a great combination of who he was and stuff the way he went berserker mode and just hacking and slashing and stuff i thought that was so great so and i'm like okay and this is like book six so that means there's so much more to come we're gonna learn more he's going to finalize all this like so basically everything that's happened in this book, in the last bit of book 13, is the stuff that I was expecting to happen for like the last six books stretched out. And it just didn't. Like, and it just, um, it all felt very rushed. So, Perrin, I mean, so I said earlier that Perrin does less than Matt in this story. And in a way, he kind of does, but what he does has such a great influence on everything that happens that I don't want to discount the importance of everything that he does. But the arc and stuff that he goes through in this book is not nearly as entertaining as I wanted it to be. We're still dealing with Slayer. Like, Slayer is the most underdeveloped villain that is, like, a one-on-one -on -one character villain ever. Like, I still feel like I don't know anything about that thing. Like, that creature, that dude. That basically what felt like just a whiny little kid that, like, ugh. They thought they had prophecies on their sides and they were going to do some stuff for the Dark One. And, like, just... It's just it, it felt like a C-list character that thought they were A-list that is getting, like, in the way of one of our A-list characters and he just can't get around them. So, it just, it, it was really annoying. So, the entire thing of him being in the wolf dream, like, pretty much all book. Like, that whole first battle and stuff when they go in there in person and he's got his IO friend and stuff that they're doing, you know, with the wolves and everything. And, like, all of that stuff, it just, it kind of amounted to nothing because... He fights Slayer again and he gets hurt and he ends up having to ditch out of the wolf dream. He almost died and everything. So I thought that was kind of weird and disappointing because I expected him to kill him and be done with that whole thing last book. And it's just like it won't 
It just keeps happening. It's like, why do we just keep dealing with it? But something comes of it. It's like we get a little bit more development of the wolf brother nature and stuff. So by virtue of being a wolf brother, Perrin has the ability to go in and out of the dream world in the flesh just naturally. So that's kind of the last bit that we had to develop into his character before we could finalize his whole arc. So that's kind of what happens after he gets injured and ends up having to, he like desperately trying to get back to the waking world because he can't heal himself in the dream world. He needs to get to an Aes Sedai, really. So he basically discovers that he can switch back and forth naturally by virtue of doing that. So when he gets back, he gets healed or a little bit of healing because they can only do so much or whatever at the time. And he basically sleeps out the most of the rest of the battle. He just kind of sleeps. Like, I was really expecting him to be in the middle of the fight, like, doing like he did at uh, Demise Well, and, like, hacking and slashing, and hack, like, really doing some damage and going full berserker mode. I mean, he kind of does a little bit in the fight with Slayer and stuff. He, like, he gets real zen and, like, switches between the wolf and his other self and stuff seamlessly and, like, gets real good at it and all that stuff. But, like, I expected it on, like, the battlefield and stuff. But it was a cool, like, you know, expectation subversion to have him do that. But the whole thing that that, that just kind of um, hits my head about Perrin's arc, the whole, like, conclusion I come to, just the literal only thing I really take away from it is Perrin is an else caller. And I think it's hilarious. Like, this has to be, like, a Brandon-ism. Like, this has to have been Brandon Sanderson just, like, like, dude, your Cosmere is showing. Like, there are so many different instances where I'm like, Brandon, your Cosmere is showing. <laughs> like, you're you're really letting your other stuff bleed out a lot. Like, the entire character of Andral, he is just, he is all Cosmere. Like, that is just all a Cosmere trope, almost. Like, um, but so, just the way Perrin's abilities work, that's basically one of the abilities that the Stormlight characters have, like, they can move into another realm and then move in that realm and then pop out back in the regular world in a different location, effectively teleporting. Like, that's exactly what Perrin ends up doing. So I'm like, he's a total freaking house caller. Like, that's a hilarious thing. That just, it didn't really come across to me that that was what Jordan was setting up with that at all. Like, even with the dream world, like, it wasn't supposed to be that usable in the way Perrin is able to use it now. But I think that's a cool addition. I think it's more interesting and dynamic. And it adds this cool flavor to this werewolf type trope type, you know, identity that has this whole other dimension to it. And I think that's a lot of fun. So we're definitely going to talk about that in more detail in my Perrin um, character breakdown video that I'm going to do later. When he gets, so when Perrin wakes up after the healing and stuff, he gets back into the dream world and he gets back at it. Time is really goofy. Time already moves differently between the two. So him having been gone for like a day or so had only felt like two hours in the dream world or whatever. So just, you know, he didn't really lose a whole lot of time. And all the time, like he's in there popping around and doing all this stuff, fighting Slayer. Landfair has been in there and she's been basically talking to him and stuff, showed him how to use the dream spike and everything. And like, she's just, it's very unclear what side she's on she seems like just being total wild card and like that's basically what we get a conclusion to like towards the end of Rand's battle with the dark one and stuff she wants to kind of sabotage the entire thing she wants to sabotage Rand's like he's basically at the final moment the either killing blow or the imprisoning blow for the dark one or whatever and she's like, let's kill Moraine and Ran, and then we'll save the Dark One, and then he'll definitely owe us, and blah, blah, blah. So, like, her allegiance was chosen then, and uh, Perrin was under compulsion because she had subtly been compelling him that entire time, throwing weaves on him, like, that entire time, doing it subtly enough that he's not able to, like, oh, it's just a weave, and, like, kind of knock it off of him or whatever. So, it kind of, he almost, like, does it. But the way he gets over it is kind of lame. Like, it's like... I was expecting it to be something along the lines of it's just another weave. Like he was like going to have to keep repeating that to himself and take his mind again. But instead it's just, oh, I love Fayil, I love Fayil. And somehow just loving Fayil translates to, or I guess loving Fayil is like the core of who he is. So like he's able to recognize himself 
enough to, you know, do the just another weave thing. But I don't know. I just thought that was weird. But either way, he breaks out the compulsion and immediately snaps Lanfear's neck. And I thought that was kind of intense because, like, he even kind of goes off in his head, like, Rand can't kill women and stuff like that. He's not good at him. Like, we all kind of have that issue. He's like, but I am capable of putting that aside, especially in this moment. He just reaches out and snaps her neck. And I was like, okay, that was... That was cool. That was pretty cool. It was intense. It was pretty cool. But yeah, other than that, Perrin really doesn't do a whole lot. Like, he loses track of Fayo because she's got the horn of Valier and she's, like, running around and stuff. And, like, she's basically... The whole thing of her in um, Thakandar, like, it reminded me of, like, um, of Sam and Frodo trying to get through where the, the orcs, yeah, the, where, you know, where they were when they were trying to get to the Mount Doom, when they were going through their forge and stuff, and they were trying to sneak past the gate and all that stuff, it gave me those vibes, like, majorly, it was just all those same kind of things, and, um, so they end up, like, uh, going under disguise and stuff, pretending to be dark friends and stuff, so they can use one of the gates in order to get through from the forge where the merge all blades are made so they can get to the battlefield so they can get the horn to Matt because they you know as the horn blower he needs to blow the horn so we can get the ghostly figures to show up again another lord of the rings thing but you know whatever but so something i had speculated before but i don't think i ever said it in the review or anything but i always wondered that um because matt died i assumed his tie to the horn was broken so I'm like, he died, so that means somebody else could use it. But, like, I wasn't even thinking much about it. So after Fayo basically sacrifices herself, she, like, leaves herself behind so the Trollocs can get her and allows Oliver to keep going. He ends up, like, stuck in this little crevice because he can't really get away and stuff. So he's, like, just stuck in this hole and stuff and freaking out as they're trying to get in to get him. And just as a last result, he blows the horn, and he becomes the new sounder of the horn. And, like, all the heroes and stuff show up and everything and, like, help him and everything. Thing. And I thought that was really, really cool. And there's something that, um, this is kind of related, but it's really tied to Elaine's story, but I'm going to talk about it here. It's um, Brigida. So Brigida later on gets murdered immediately. Like it just happens kind of out of nowhere. Like um, Elaine is about to be kidnapped because the dark friends want her babies and stuff. And they grab uh, Brigida and like chop her head off. And she's like immediately dead after having lost all her memories and stuff. I'm like, whoa, like that was so abrupt. It was just so insane. It just happened so quick that it just took me back. It shocked me for a minute. But of course she then comes back later when Oliver sounds the horn and stuff. So, in that moment, like, that entire concept, to me, started to make me wonder, like, is Oliver the ugly guy that she's supposed to, that she's destined to be with over and over? Like, how he's only just, like, a few years older than her or whatever? Because Oliver's still pretty young, right? He's not, like, 10. He's not even above 10, I don't think. And, um, so, I was wondering, like, is that... So, is that because, like, now he's the sounder of the horn and stuff, and she was reborn. So, like, maybe, like, there, maybe, 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 I don't know, maybe. <laughs> that could just be, like, an extra little theory I got, I guess. But, um, I think that, yeah, that pretty much covers, uh, Perrin. Do I got anything else I want to say about Perrin? Um, oh, yeah, the thing that I want to finish off Perrin's thing with, that had to do with Fayo. Like, so, Fayo left behind and stuff. And she, we basically assume she's dead. It's all set up as she's dead. But we don't get a body, so I'm immediately like, she's not dead. She's just going to show up later. It's it's a very clear, obvious, very transparent trope. And, um, so later on, at the very end of the book, I think this is even during the epilogue, where Perrin's going through the battlefield and stuff, through the bodies and stuff, and ends up finding Fael safe and sound, hidden up under bodies and a horse and stuff. She would have had to have been there for like two days or something. Like, it's... It's just the most, uh, I don't know, it's just so weird to me how Perrin's entire character got reduced down to I love Fael and I don't want to be as badass as I naturally am. Like, it's just such a weird thing to do with that character to me and then to, like, have him never truly get over it or anything like that. It's just, I don't know, it's weird. But, like, now I guess he's kind of a king because uh, Brashir dies. So, Fael is royal. So he's married into royal, so everybody's royal. Uh, Matt's a monarch, and he's a monarch, and Rand just like, doop, doop, I'm going to light my pipe, and I'm going to just go. <laughs> so like, that's just kind of funny. Um, so yeah, who's next? Let's talk about, let's talk about the Tracan brothers really quick. I think this is a decent time. Um, yeah, then we'll talk about um, Lan, I guess. That should all be kind of wrapped in the same area. So... 
going back to Demandre, he is the leader of the basically the largest force of the shadow. So he's the biggest big bad we're trying to deal with at the moment. And so everybody's basically trying. So um Gawain's got the the rings, the Teangriol from the blood knives that were trying to kill Egwene. And so he's using three of them. And these things are like deadly as hell. Like they're going to kill you. They basically suck out your life force and stuff in exchange for less pain, more speed, more strength, and the, abil the ability to be kind of like obscured in shadows and stuff like that. So he uses three of them and he's almost basically invisible. And he like goes up to Demon Dread and trying to fight him and stuff. But Demon Dread's power is such that. But <laughs> Demon Dread, Demon Dread's power is like such that like, he's so powerful right now because I think he has, like, a circle of, like, 72 channelers behind him or something. Like, he's so ridiculously overpowered at the moment that, like, I guess that just gives him the ability to see through the weaves. He, like, called them, like, clouds of darkness or something. The Tauron girl is based on a specific kind of read or, or weave, obviously. So, he just sees through it like this is nothing or whatever. So, as uh, Gawain's trying to fight him and stuff, he's a badass swordsman and stuff. So, like, he's actually trying to, you know, put up a decent fight and everything, but actually like it doesn't really matter because Demandre is just like blah blah knocking this stuff off knocking this stuff off then stabs him and like immediately runs him through and I was like okay like whoa I'm like I if you know th hearing about this situation hearing about what he's doing like thinking about going up against this guy I'm like yes of course you're going to die <laughs> like that's what's going to happen you're not strong enough to do this so when it happened I was still kind of shocked like oh that happened? The logical conclusion actually happened. Like, okay, so yeah, you're dead. And um, so Egwene, of course, feels that. Like, she feels the pain and everything. And, like, they can't save him. He eventually dies and everything. And, like, someone was asking her if she wanted to, like, switch the bomb or whatever to make it less painful for her and everything. Which may have been a contributing factor to what happens to her, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? No one will know. But um, pretty much after that, um, his brother, Galad, like, tries his hand at it, too. But before he dies, he tells him, like, um, I believe, yeah, I believe it's Gawa. I'm pretty sure it's Gawa. He tells him that he's Rand's half-brother. They have, like, the same mom um, and, uh, you know, obviously different dads or same, same dad, maybe? I don't remember. They have, they're half-brothers. And he basically tells him, don't hate Rand so much, kind of get over it, and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay. And, like, he goes and fights Demon Dread and thinks he's going to do good, too. Because, like, both of the Trakran brothers, they're actually both really good fighters and stuff. But, like I said, my favorite part is still when Matt kicked her ass his way back when. But they, um, so he um, goes and gives it a shot. He doesn't get killed like his brother does, but he loses an arm. And it's like, ah, oh, nobody can kill this dude. Nobody can stop Demon Dread. He's got, like, all these channelers and stuff with him. He's a ridiculous, like, battle strategist. And he's a crazy, powerful force in and of himself. It's, like, just weird. We can't win so everybody on the side of the light is like matt is screwing us over he is he is so bad at this like we can't see any of his strategy like we don't know what's going on we're losing we're losing we're losing all while demon dread is on the other side like man whoever i'm going up against it has to be lose clear because this stuff is awesome like his strategy is amazing blah, blah, blah. so i just like that dynamic too i thought that was a lot of fun but um so everybody's like trying to get them and like nobody can get them so like now we got to talk about land so, because Lan is the one that eventually gets the kill. But Lan, earlier in the book, he, you know, still kind of doing the same thing he was doing before. He's got all this Malkyrie and stuff, and they're fighting that battle. And he's at the point where he's like, all the people that started to follow him, like, they've lost pretty much everyone. Like, he's down to like 6,000 people or something. And he's basically like, okay, this is basically going to be our final charge. We're going to give it all we got. We're going to try, and we're probably all going to die. And then, like, a straight-up Avengers moment happens where it's, like, the on your left and, like, all the gateways and stuff start opening. And then out of nowhere, his 6,000 goes from, like, 6,000 to 100,000. And it's like, oh, no, it's a real fight. No, let's go. I was really hyped at this moment, though. I was like, yeah, like, let's go. Like, let's really get it going and stuff because that was when all the fight was really starting to go. So that was a really cool rallying moment and stuff. And so that was pretty much guaranteed we're still going to keep land and stuff. So land basically is just off, like, coordinating all the um the the borderlanders and like all the people helping the borderlanders like stuff he's like doing all of that stuff for like the longest time and whatnot but when he gets back to Marilor, he basically is about to he's after everything has happened with demon dre he's like okay now it's my turn to like go after him and stuff and then um as he's basically charging loyal is over on the side and like well let me chronicle the last suicide
suicide charge of the king of Melkir and stuff like that. And because like it looked like a straight up suicide charge, like there's no way he can win. Like there's a bunch of Trollocs in the way and stuff. And Tam is over there like with him and stuff. Like well, we can help this out. Then a bunch of the badass Two Rivers archers, because all of them are insane marksmen with like their enhanced bows and stuff. And they all one shot all of these Trollocs and stuff and like cut laying the whole path to Demon Dread and stuff. I thought that was so cool. That's gonna make a cool scene in the show, assuming we get that far. Like that could be season. Who the hell knows? <laughs> Could be so far but like it's really cool and then he goes up to him and like he gets some really good lines and stuff he's like um he um demon dread asks like who are you he's like i'm the man that's gonna kill you and like he starts like they start fighting or whatever and then he's telling lane he's like you can't win like you're a really good swordsman you're an amazing swordsman and all this stuff but you can't win and lane's like i didn't say i was gonna beat you i said i was gonna kill you and like leans into him and as a result gets stabbed and he's able to, like, stab uh, Demon Dread, like, through the throat and stuff. And able to, like, decapitate him and take his whole head off and stuff. So, Lan wins. He kills Demon Dread and, like, makes a major, like, take, like, gives a major blow to the shadow. It basically starts to crumble the organization of their entire force. So, Lan does this amazing thing. But he took a wound that I just knew was going to kill him. I'm like, yes, that is, like, a great way for him to die. Like, if he has to die and stuff. That's so honorable and so heroic and stuff. It's so cool. And then, like, he didn't die. Because, like, there's so many fake out deaths in this book. It's like, oh, my God. Because, like, we switch POVs almost immediately after that. Then we come back to it. And they talk about, yeah, Lane's alive, Lane's above. I'm like, oh, I, I just knew he was dead. I thought Brandon would have killed him. Like, but I guess he didn't. I think a lot of that is a little bit of Brandonisms, too. There's a lot of instances in here where I think characters were dead or should have died. And Brandon kind of pulled it back. And there's this other thing. Um, I'm going to kind of just wrap this in here with Lance because I think that's pretty much all the Lance stuff we got really to talk about. But I'm going to wrap um, this other thing in here too. So like, um, I kind of, like the Swan and Gareth Brand deaths, right? So this is a thing that um, I'm curious about, I guess. So I believe it was in one of the books uh, Robert Jordan wrote, you know, without Brandon and stuff. So like, I'm pretty sure... Um, it was in one of those where we had the situation where Swan and Bren almost died, but by being near each other, they were able to save each other. To me, that felt like the conclusion of that viewing. It felt like that was supposed to be the point of that viewing. And the twist of it was when Swan delved into uh, Bren to see that there was more to heal or whatever. Granted, they had questions about that scenario because it was like a chicken or the egg thing. So there's a little doubt behind it. So this other instance kind of makes sense. But it almost feels like Brandon undid something Jordan did just for the sake of shock value to me. That's kind of how it came across. I don't know. I don't have any evidence that like, you know, Jordan wasn't going to do this twist, <laughs> but I don't know. It just felt like he needed more body count and couldn't find anything to do with Bryn after the whole compulsion thing. And Swan basically has been a non-entity for like the last four books or something. Last five books, maybe actually since she's been stealed really. And even since she got her power back, she's only been like spy master, but so it kind of felt like that. It kind of came across like that to me. Let me know in the comments if you felt like that too. Did did it feel like Brandon reversed what Jordan had did there, or is that just me? Well, we just talked about the other trick hand, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, Elaine for a second. So apart from all the cool, well, kind of cool from her perspective, but a little power hungry, scary um, stuff she was doing in the meeting early on. Elaine like actually handles herself really well with commanding all the armies and stuff. Her strategies are sound. All the generals and stuff are like, yeah, that's not a bad idea and all that stuff so they're all supporting her and stuff so that's going really cool and it's really interesting because i never got that from that family or from this character at all that she had any real battle strategy or any real like scope or scale of this kind of stuff it seems to just be kind of written off the fact that she you know was a princess or whatever so of course royal people are trained to have that kind of stuff i guess so it just it, you know it, to me again like it felt like it should have been matt it just simply should have been matt so the part i already talked about before about brigida's uh, head getting chopped off so it kind of happens in the instance of elaine getting kidnapped when um, they wanted to cut her babies out of her and kill her and take the kid, like the shadow wanted to use her kids for something or whatever. And I'm like, whoa, 
Like, holy crap. And they even kind of acknowledge it. Like, she says it in her head. Like, yes, this could still fulfill men's viewing or whatever. Like, my kids can still be born healthy or whatever. But that doesn't mean I have to live. Which is the point. I feel like me and everybody that's been reading up to this point has been making that every moment. Every time she does something reckless. Everybody's been saying that. So, I'm like, this would be a perfect instance to basically show the consequences. Like, if she was to actually get killed in this instance, as dark as that is and as disturbing as that situation is, that would feel like such a perfect ramification of all the warnings she's gotten. But she, of course, gets saved by the heroic Brigitte, but then <laughs> with the ghost of Brigitte, basically. And it's like, that whole situation I thought was really cool. Their dynamic, like in this book, I really, really like their dynamic. To the point where I honestly think they make a better couple than her with Rand. But like I said, I'm pretty sure Brigitte is going to be with Oliver. Like, because he's, I mean, he's, uh, they, they never really talk about Oliver's looks or anything. You know, he's just a kid or whatever. And obviously he hasn't grown up into his looks or anything. But I imagine he's going to be pretty rough in the face. And he's going to meet this new version of Brigitte, whoever she's been reborn as. And that's going to be something nice to happen in a new age and stuff. So I kind of think that's where that's going. Um, so yeah, Elaine didn't like, you know, she didn't have like a whole lot of temple stuff to happen in this book. She was, uh, you know, clear fixture and stuff like that, but she didn't have a lot of crazy, interesting, like action moments or anything like that. Not like Egwene. So Egwene has been basically annoying and always is vaguely annoying and stuff, mostly because of the, how bratty she's been and how overly arrogant stuff she's been. So over the last few days after I finished the book, I've been thinking about, you know, about all the characters and stuff and been kind of sitting with it. So when I came to this thought about Egwene, I came to this kind of conclusion about her. So it's like Egwene herself is gone. Egwene herself has kind of been burned away by the flame of Tarvalin. So she has become her perception of what an Omerlin should be. She has taken on the entire perception of what she believes the White Tower itself is. So herself as a person has basically been cut off. So like a lot of her more annoying things that she's been doing, like her level of arrogance and just like wanting control and all that kind of stuff. I think it really does come from this place of thinking that is what the Amarlin should be. That is thinking what, you know, that is like her trying to take this big responsibility so super seriously. So I think that is where a lot of that comes from. So a lot of her more annoying tendencies and stuff she does, especially in the last few books and stuff, I think it's a lot easier to kind of accept because it feels to me like it was really illustrated with her death. So she ends up going into battle after like leading all these cool charges and stuff. She's using the Tangriel or Sangriel and like it. So she's like amped up and stuff. And she's wrecking house and like everybody, Aes Sedai are just wrecking house and stuff like that. And um, so she ends up going up against Taim when he finally makes it to the battle. He brings in the Ashraman that he uh, trans. He, turned and stuff and he finally makes it to the battle and she goes up against him and I thought that was just a cool setup because it's kind of effectively the leader of the black tower versus the leader of the white tower and like it's just really cool it's, even though I always consider Logan gain as the true leader of the black tower which of course he will be going forward but I just thought that was like a cool dynamic you know battle clash of the titans kind of thing so earlier, Egwene had realized through seeing those cracks, because every time anyone used Bellfire, it's unraveling the pattern, and we're starting to get physical representations of the damage that it's doing. So there's these cracks that are forming in the ground and on rocks and stuff like that. They look like regular cracks, but if you look at them, they cut through a blackness that cuts through all reality. So it's just the destruction of reality itself, basically. She just kind of experiments with the weave and is able to mend it, and it creates like these crystals on it, which I think is a another Brandonism that feels like some um, co cognitive realm type stuff. That is some straight up like cultivation spring type stuff with the crystals like growing off of it and everything. It just, it feels like a Brandonism. <laughs> like it does. But um, so basically she effectively discovers a new weave when she does this and she going up against Tyene who started using Bellfire and stuff. And she eventually uses that weave against the Bellfire and it reacts like anti-Bell, um, yeah, Bellfire, which is another, it feels like a super Cosmere-ism because with the stuff we're learning in the recent um, Stormlight Archive books, 
has a lot of similar shades to this entire concept. So this is like either Brandon workshopping some ideas that he was going to use later, or he got a little inspired by some of Jordan's notes that he left or something. Like, I don't know. It's just, it's so interesting. Cause like in this one, you really, you really start to see Brandon's Cosmere isms, like just slip all out, <laughs> like just all over the place. It was kind of, it's fun. Cause I really love his writing, but it is almost jarring in the differences a lot of the time. So what she does when she blasts him with like the anti bellfire, like it goes through his blast and stuff and nullifies it and goes into him and stuff. And it just basically turns into a pillar of crystal or whatever and it kills him effectively. So it was like a really cool thing. It was a really cool uh, moment. But of course, Egwene had been using so much power. She, the song girl she was using has no buffer. So she was pulling in so much power that she was effectively burnt out. So if she stopped using any of the one power, she was going to have no ability to channel after that. So basically, instead of doing that, she pulled as much power as she possibly could and used that against Taim for the anti-Bellfire thing and effectively obliterated herself. She burned herself out to the point where her entire body is gone. And I think that was basically an illustration of her truly becoming the flame of Tarvalin. The weave is named the flame of Tarvalin. That's the last thing she did and her body and stuff entirely disintegrated. And now there's like a crystal pillar there that can only be destroyed with Bellfire, but people aren't using it right now. So that's going to basically turn into like a monument for her. So I just thought that entire nature of her arc was brilliant because the character who she was as a person, I think was burned away when she was under the Idom or the, yeah, the Idom or whatever in the dream world. And she had to basically ch change her brain a little bit in order to just to weave it, you know, just to like take it off or whatever. So I think that was basically when Egwene died and the Omerlin was truly galvanized as just the Omerlin. So it just felt like a really thematically appropriate way for her to basically become the flame of Tarvalin and kind of go out in that way. It was a sad loss, but it felt like a true appropriate culmination of her arcs. So I just really appreciated that one. So let's talk about some more uh, quick little uh, fire off characters like Loghain. I thought Loghain was going to be a little bit bigger, especially when they like, uh, you know, ungentled him and stuff. And I just kind of thought he was going to be a bigger character. Like he will be later on, like cause he's clearly got like a new motivation for the Black Tower to be about protection and stuff like that. So I imagine in the future he's going to be like really cool and like make a great Armorland or whatever they'll call their high seat or whatever of the Black Tower and stuff. So I thought that was kind of cool, but he was a little underutilized in my opinion. I wonder if Jordan had other ideas for him that he never like wrote down notes and stuff for. So Brandon didn't have really have anything to work with. I wonder if it was a situation or something like that. Um, all right, so this review is really, really long, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up with a, another little bit of character discussion. Let's talk about um, Andral and Pavara. I already talked about them a little bit, but I want to kind of talk about them in a little more detail. This is the thing that I think a lot of people in the fandom of Wheel of Time kind of complain about a bit about this book, because this is the most Cosmere thing I think Brandon does in these last three books this like andrew feels so much like a cosmere character sometimes i wasn't sure which one i was reading it honestly felt like uh he felt like he could have been a part of bridge four like the character is so distinctly of the cosmere flavor that is just so impossible to ignore down to the point where brandon wrote the character under the rules of his magic systems he the if you've ever watched like any of Brandon's um, um, live or his recorded uh, class sessions when he teaches um, I think at uh, in Arizona or somewhere he teaches uh, uh, creative writing and will talk about world building and you know stuff like that and the magic systems and whatnot and just all kinds of stuff. Brandon's very social. Whatever. <laughs> like point being, he has explained the way he approaches magic systems and stuff um, very detail in ways and stuff. So one of the things that always sticks with me is the thing where he was saying that um, limitations slash rules are more interesting than the powers. So that entire concept, that framework is Andral. 
It's like he is a very weak channeler. Like he can only pull so much of the power, but he has this talent with gateways. So he has this very like limited area where he's just this master, this expert in and stuff. So it's just, it, it feels so much like a Cosmere thing. It's just, it gives me so much of that kind of flavor of the type of stuff he interjects in his um, regular writing and stuff. So I just, it, it's something I just couldn't get past. But the entire dynamic of the stuff that he does with it is a lot of fun. Like the two-way bonding with uh, those two. I think that's a really cool dynamic, how they eventually are basically completely telepathic with each other. How she's able to make use of his talent and stuff like that so like it would be amazing like i would love like a random sequel book of just some you know far enough ahead period that we don't really have to be too connected to all these characters but to see what happens like the black tower and the white tower like form some gray tower and just like everybody's bonded to each other like all the husband and wives and stuff if you know the, assume the Aes Sedai and the any of the Ashima, you know like each other and stuff get married like it could be kind of a regular thing for that kind of double bond thing and everything I don't know just all of that it just it adds more to the world building and that'll be a lot of fun to speculate with and play with and stuff later on so I like that but um Andrew and Pavar, they actually get like a lot of really cool moments and stuff even though initially I had an issue with them because I'm like dude we're in the last book and you're introducing brand new characters and giving them this whole arc and this whole scenario that should have been taken care of a while ago. So I just kind of had an attitude about it. But then I really got into the characters. Like, the characters are just really well done. Like, it's just a hallmark of the way Brandon writes. Like, he can he can introduce you to a brand new character you know nothing about. And he can still make them compelling enough for you to at least be like, okay, that was a cool guy. Like, may not be your favorite, but definitely won't be your least favorite. So it's, like, really interesting that he can do that. And it's just, like, again... Like, it's such a Cosmerism, like, the way the character works. and But he got some really great moments. I love when he uses gateways to basically drop lava on a bunch of shadow spawns and stuff like that. Like, that was amazing. Like, how they tricked people and stuff. Like, um, faking people out and stuff. There's just, like, some just amazing uses of the abilities and those limitations and stuff. So, like, it's really interesting the way it's done, but it kind of takes you out of it. It's a little jarring. It's just kind of a really interesting dynamic. So I'm probably going to talk a lot uh, more about that, you know, as I go on and make other videos where I can get in the nitty gritty about, you know, some of the more granular stuff from the series. But yeah, <laughs> I like that stuff quite a bit. I like that relationship. I like that dynamic, but I do think it was a little jarringly different for the world that we've been in for the last 15 or 13, 14 books or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably going to do it. I've covered a lot of the book, but of course I can go into great, great detail on everything because there's just so much stuff. We'll talk, um, some more about it in another video. So definitely leave me some comments, some good comments down there. Let me know what's your favorite parts of the book. Let me know. Yeah, specifically, like, let me know some of your favorite parts because I want to kind of either do like a, do some kind of other video about it. I want to basically react to your comments and use that as a discussion topic a little bit. So I want to see what some of your favorite parts were so I can actually vocally respond to them and stuff like that. So I'll pick out some good comments and that'll lead to discussion. So yeah, um, basically tell me in the comments down below some stuff I didn't talk about in this review that you thought was really cool or that you liked. Let me know about the dynamics between the way Brandon's writing and using Robert Jordan's notes and stuff like that. How do you think he did? Do you think he pulled it off? I really do believe he stuck the landing. I think this was a really satisfying ending. It didn't just like unfold the way I expected it to. It was a lot of um, expectations that were subverted, but not done in a very cheap way. There was some stuff that I didn't like. There was some stuff that I was amazed by. There was some stuff I was whole hum about. There's very few books that can give you the full swath of emotions. And this really kind of does it. And I'm just generically, generically, I'm just like on a general level, extra impressed by that because it's not often that a series can even do that because this series definitely has. There's books that I don't care for. There's books that I adore. There's books that I'm like me medium on and stuff like that. This series has like a level of variety that I've never experienced in reading a series before ever. And I just think it's really, really cool. So yeah, let me know all your thoughts in the comments down below. Make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I will talk to you all next time. Peace. <laughs>